Hey everybody, it's Warwick here from Beware and uh, I've got Zanal with me today who's going to be my co-host and we're chatting to Siggy Koko from the US. Uh, while everybody's still trying to get in, we're going to just uh, have a bit of an introduction side of things and welcome you all today for joining us. Thanks for coming on board. We look forward to having an awesome conversation about building naturally with Siggy and uh, uh, Zanal's going to help me out from... Uh, uh, self-sufficient homesteading and gardening side and uh it's going to be an epic talk so thanks for coming on the way that we do this is we're going to do about a 45 minute conversation and just an open flow conversation talking about uh siggy what she's up to and uh her background and who she is i think a lot of you guys probably do know already some of that um and then we'll do uh frequent ask questions off that and then open up the floor to uh to you guys see what you want to ask and what you want to find out from CE directly. So um, thanks for joining us again, guys. And if you, if uh, uh, CE, if you can introduce yourself and just let us know, you know, everybody, you know, uh, who wants to know who you are, who doesn't know who you are just yet. Tell us, tell us who you are, what, what what's your background. And thanks for joining us as well today. It's awesome to have you on board. Oh, absolutely. It's my, my pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Siggy Coco. I am an architect and I design exclusively what I call natural buildings. And what natural buildings are to me are buildings that use materials from nature harvested around you nearby, um, right. materials that are in abundance nearby that are harvested without harm to the environment that you're existing in, and then used in a way that creates an energy efficient building. Um, and so there's a wide gamut of aesthetics that happen, but what, what is a little bit unique about the way that I work is that because I'm using materials that are considered alternative materials, I also teach the methods for using them appropriately and durably. So um, I'm an architect that also gets muddy and dirty and hands-on, and I love teaching Maybe. and empowering people how to how to build homes. Brilliant, love it. So yeah, so um, thanks again for coming on board and sharing that with us. And uh, so from our side, I mean, basically Zanel and I and uh, Tanya is unable to join us today. She's She's, She's the main uh, uh, party behind, or co-host behind uh, self-sufficient uh, homesteading and gardening. Uh, she's had a major hailstorm where she is, and literally so bad that it's kind of like uh, livestock lost their lives and so on and so forth. So she's not being able to join us today. But our background as well is just you know being able to build uh, build people up in their local area. I'm mainly into bees, as you can see with my logo at the back there. Uh, but I'm also about harnessing nature's biodiversity. And Zanel, uh, who's, who's my co-host today, is standing for, for Tanya. Uh, tell us quickly a little bit about you, Zanel, so we know who, who's, who's, who you are before we um, get going. Well, I'm in the stead for um, self-sufficient homesteading and gardening. And um, I've been part of the group and friends with Tanya for a while now. Um, so yeah, just she pressed on my button and I'm like, yes, we do this. So I don't yeah. really have much of a background to share. Um, <laughs> well, what about your, you, you do the biggest seed swap, right? Seed swap program in Africa, basically. Yeah, just purely because there aren't <laughs> many in existence. Um, but yeah, I do Bestowed in Abundance, which is a seed swap initiative that is reaching across the entire country, providing people even in um, locations which might be a little bit uh, far off and not as accessible for them to get a nice variety of seeds to get growing. Um, so reaching those people as well. Uh, some of us are lucky. We're in the metropolitan areas where we can congregate and do physical swaps, um, which I also facilitate. Um, but not everyone is so fortunate to have a community where a lot of people are growing, hence the national seed swap that I run. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks as well for standing in at such short notice. It's awesome. All right, guys. Big I think pleasure. we, yeah, it's cool to have you on as well. Um, so I think, you know, we've, uh, given guys enough time to join us and get settled in and get comfortable. So I think let's rock on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> all right, so Siggy, tell us. All right, so I think one of the biggest things that I want to know is is what would you what what you know in a, what would you kind of say to somebody that says I'd love to build mm-hmm. naturally, right? But I can't. I can't mm-hmm. because. Mm-hmm. Go for it. What's your what's what's the Siggyism around this? What what are they what is what comes out when people turn around and say that? Because I have the same thing with beekeeping. They're like, oh, I'd like the beekeeping, but I don't have the property. Oh, I've got don't know, you know. I don't know how much it's going to cost me, you know? So tell us about yours. What are yours? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the quick, easy answer that's really snarky is, um, yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yes, you can. <laughs> so, Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, actually, someone... I, I have sort of this mantra of just start with something. Start with something small that you don't care about. Right, love it. Um, and someone sent me a note yesterday with a photo that they were hearing that voice in their head of me uh-huh. saying that, just start with something. And they pulled over on the side of the road, got out of their car and just made a big clay little, I mean, not big. It was, you know, maybe if, I don't know, 10 centimeters tall. I'm, I'll try to talk metric. <laughs> All right. uh, thank you. Yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> You know, and just did this little sculpture just digging on the side of the road. And that's the point. It doesn't, getting familiar with natural materials means just putting your hands in it and starting somewhere. It could be an oven. It could be a bench. It could be a little sculpture that you let die in the rain. It could be a chicken coop. It could be a kid's playhouse, a bike storage. Like, it doesn't matter. You Do you have friends or family that you, you know, if you don't have a place, do you have friends or family that would let you dig a hole in their yard and then build something cool for them? You know, the point is to just begin because you learn about the materials by touching them, seeing what they're capable of. Getting your hands dirty, yeah, literally. Absolutely, absolutely. And then there's all of these other, I feel like as people, when there is something new confronting us, it can be frightening, right? Not like, you know, scary movie frightening, but it can be intimidating, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, so take away, and so what we do is we create these excuses why we can't, so that we have an excuse not to be intimidated, right? Yeah. Um, and, And if you hear yourself saying, I can't because, and then fill in the blank, like dissect it a little bit. What is that thing? Is it okay? It doesn't meet building codes. That's not true. It absolutely meets building codes. And you could start with something little that doesn't require a building permit, like a bench, right? Or a garden wall. Um, It's going to cost too much. Well, if 75% of it is your labor cost, that means you don't have the time or you don't really want it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, how bad do you want it then? You know? That, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. And so each reason not to do it has an answer. There's always a solution. Yeah. And it's about breaking those barriers down and just start somewhere. All right. Yeah. And I mean, if you, you were talking about something small, so you named a couple of projects there. I mean, can you, you know, whittle off some of the top ones that you would recommend people to, to look up, stuff, and maybe resources you've got that they could use, you could share with the guys? Yeah, so the, um, I think the most popular small project is the clay oven, right? So you can awesome. bake. Yeah, yeah they're, they're <laughs> sort of wood-fired ovens that um, they come to. Uh, this, I can't do felt Fahrenheit to Celsius, so I have to say it in Fahrenheit. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Not but yet. about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's, they're so hot that if you take flour and you throw it into the oven, it um, spontaneously combusts. So it, wow. when I teach this to kids, I always do that because they get so excited to see the sparkling, <laughs> <laughs> the that's sparkling cool. flour. That's, yeah. a good, that's a good, it's a oven trick, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you know, it's hot enough to cook a pizza in a few minutes. Um, so it's a very practical first run. And if it falls apart, yeah, okay, so two days of your time learning, that's yeah. not so bad. And that one, I think I shared a link with you that you could share with everyone if you're so inclined. Yeah, yeah. And it's step-by-step, photos, description, video, how to build one. 
Yeah, no, that is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, no, great. All right, and what else? What else? I mean, you mentioned the garden wall. I think that's pretty easy as well, right? How, I mean, what, what are we kind of talking about if we're talking cost-wise? You mentioned that some people might feel that that's a bit of a restraint or a limit on their, on their budget. I mean, how, in a, you know, on an average sort of scale, what were you talking about? How many bags of this and that? And Yeah, so I would almost even take one step back and just um, when we're talking about natural building, the material palette that we're typically talking about is um, so stone, clay, which is found in soil everywhere in the world. There is clay soil. Um, and it's that sticky soil that when you add water to it, it sticks to your hands and you can make a ball, right? Then yeah. you know you have clay. Squeegee. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and then usually some kind of a fiber. So where we live, there's lots of um, wheat farming, oat, barley, you know, sort of those grains. So we use a lot of straw as our fiber, but everywhere in the world, there is something that can be used as a fiber. Um, and the clay is the binder, it's the stickiness. Mm -hmm. There's generally um, sand in the soil and that sand is, um, so it, it prevents shrinkage and it creates compressive strength. So compressive strength is the ability for you to push on it without the material squishing, right? right? So it, it becomes very strong in compressive strength. And then the fibers create like a tensile strength, like an interior armature almost, or structure inside that as anything moves, those fibers kind of hold everything together. It's sort right. of like reinforced concrete, but natural. Yeah, right? kind of like our spine, right? It's kind of like our spine and, and Absolutely. kind of thing. Cool. Absolutely. So if you're talking about a wall, right? Um, if the clay material, clay materials are strongest when they're dry. So we want to get it up off the ground because the ground has moisture in it all the time, um, okay. even in dry climates. And so you would build some kind of a small uh, stone wall at the bottom, right? So, and I mean little, right? Again, right. 10 yeah. to 20 centimeters. Yeah, gotcha. And then start with the clay on top of that. So building the clay up from there, and then you need something on top to make like a roof, right? But it doesn't have to be, it can be shingles, it can be more stone, it could be reclaimed tile, um, it could be thatch, it could be any number of things that you would consider to be a roofing material. Right, right, um, yeah. So it could be free. Yeah. I mean, if you've got all of that, I mean, pretty much it sounds like a lot of that could be just harvested from your backyard, yeah. right? Or a neighbor's yeah. Absolutely. In the area, which is awesome. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah. So uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier on, like the build there's building codes and stuff like that. So a lot of this stuff, I think, wouldn't need to be, you know, something that requires building codes, right? So, I mean, this is everything, anything that we've been talking, you've just listed now, we've chatted about, it doesn't need any of that, right? People right. can just build that in their backyard and if it doesn't work, you just break it down or let it wash away and you clear it and start again if you want. Absolutely. Uh, be there this weekend, gone the next if you wanted to, too, right? It takes a little longer than a weekend to disappear, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> On its own, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But now that, that, that beautiful picture oven, right? I just want to, before I move on from this picture oven, because that photograph, those photographs I've seen of yours of that one particular picture oven is epic. I'll mm -hmm. share I'll share the the link to the page of that in the chat with everybody a bit later. Um, but I want to I want to it's it's like pretty. I mean, how did you get? What did you do to do the finishing on that? Because that to me, I mean, a lot of people I think can understand and picture a picture of it in their mind, yeah. Uh, and they've probably seen one somewhere on the internet, you know, along the lines. But the one that you've done, or that one that you've sent photos of, of to me, just how did you finish that? Can you can you give us a bit of insight into that? Because I found that. Is remarkable. that the one that looks like a blue egg? Yeah, it looks like yeah. it's like it's a sci-fi, like you know what I mean, like a, almost like a spaceship. Like you, you know, you get a. <laughs> it's yeah, brilliant. so it's beautiful as well. It's like silver and black, right? Silver, black, yeah. and blue. Yeah, yeah. So that particular oven, so it's um, it's sculpted out of clay, and then it has an insulating layer that has a lot more straw in it. So straw. The thing with tubular fibers is that there's air inside and whenever you have air pockets, you have insulating properties. And what that means is you keep heat on one side and it doesn't transfer through. 
So it has low conductance through the material. So it has first the clay, which is what warms up, then insulation, which is the same materials, but more straw, less clay. And right. then on top of that, we did um, a lime plaster and a technique called Tadelact, T-A-D-E-L-A-K-T. And that is a Moroccan technique for finishing lime plaster where wow. you apply the, pl it's a very binder rich plaster that you then trowel and compress and burnish. Um, and then you add a soap to it and the soap, soap has stearic acid in it and the acid reacts with the unreacted lime and makes an interior wax. So that wax is impregnated in the plaster, right? Cause it cures inside the plaster. Right. Um, and that creates a waterproof finish. Um, my caveat to that is that one of my other mantras is plaster is not a roofing material. So if you use plaster as the finished material on an oven, right, which is a dome basically, yeah. it will fail at some point. And where you live and how harsh your climate is depends on how long it will fail, but it will eventually fail. So. Right, okay. You just have to know that. And then so you're, you know, to avoid that, you'd put a roof over, right? That's right. Or build in the same way that I described with the wall that you could build a roof right onto the top of the wall. You could add shingles right to the top of your oven. Right, right. right? Gotcha. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, that's pretty awesome. I'm going to share the link to that, to your page on that, because I Great. think that is certainly something that people and I've and it's and you've done that beautifully as well. I mean, it's step by step. You got all the resources, which is phenomenal. So yeah, we'll share that with everybody uh, towards the end of this, towards the end of the, the today's Zoom. Um, all right. So tell us. So so okay. So people are a bit worried about building bigger stuff, right? If they 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 might have thought about it. I've thought about it, and I'm like, as I said to you before, I'm like, what is the question? It, you know. What, sorry, what are, the, um, what are the barriers to entry or barriers to doing this kind of thing? And my number one thing is um, building codes. You know, I'd like to be able to build a, um, an extra room onto the side of our, onto the side of the building that, where I am now. But it's basically going to end up being like, kind of like a gazebo, but closed off because of the winter when it's cold. And um, I've got questions. And then immediately the question was like, what are the neighbors going to say? And are they going to report me to the building, to the, to the council? You know, <laughs> or to the local, mm -hmm. wherever it is, the, the county that checks these things out. So mm -hmm. uh, hit me, hit me with your your best shot about that. What's 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 the what should I what do I do? Who who's generally the people I kind of contact? What do I have to look out for? Flags, suggestions. Yeah. So this is one where I have to speak, kind of to um, North States. America. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm in the ahead. United States. Yeah, and, and people complain about building codes all the time here, um, but I'm actually quite pro building code. And the reason I am pro building code is that there's a reason why they're out there. Um, and the reason is safety, durability, and energy efficiency. Um, and those are all greater goods that I believe in. So um, it doesn't do me any good to build something that requires a lot more energy to use than it's not quite natural to me. Um, your carbon footprint over time is your heating bill. Um, and if you need to add more heat because you built it in a way that wasn't energy efficient, your carbon footprint is enormous regardless of how much mud you used. Um, so I'm, I'm pro building code and, and in the United States, the way it works is that um, we, of course, because we're very US centric, we call our codes the international building codes, even though they're just for the US. Um, because, you know, okay. it's so American, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even when we start going to Mars, it'll probably be the same, you know? But hey, yeah. hey ho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, but the beauty of our building codes is the first paragraph in the code, every single version of the code in the US begins with a paragraph about alternative materials and methods. 
And what that paragraph says is you can use alternatives if you demonstrate that you have met the intention behind each regulation in the code. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. And my guess is that your sound is a little low all of a sudden. I don't know if your um, thing is still plugged in, mm. just so you know. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, it's still, I think it's not coming through your headset anymore. Um, but so uh, I, my guess is that every code has some kind of allowance for how to, how to use something that's new. Otherwise there could never ever be new products, ever, never, right? And we have new products all the time, right? Um, and so if we think of these are really old products that we're using that aren't manufactured products, but um, they're new to the paradigm of construction, yeah. right? And so, well, um, at least in our age, and of our age, right? Because I think a lot of people, my my initial thing, I think we sort of, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I wanted to uh, sort of, oh, that's a big note for me. That was also a big one for me because a lot of people I spoke to were like, no, man, you can't build like that anymore. That's kind of like looking back from where I, you know, back to, to, to Africa and all that sort of thing. And I'm like, that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's old style. It's like so, you know, middle aged or not even middle age, it's kind of like African. And then I started digging into this. I was like, no, it's not. This has been built all over the world, so many places, right? And uh, and some of those buildings still stand, actually. Right, right? absolutely, uh, absolutely. So on all like people's perception as well, it's like in beekeeping, you know, there's a, there's, there's a number of people, you know, different perception in beekeeping, like especially, um, we've got a perception in South Africa where, where my business is and beekeeping, where, where our focus is. Uh, a lot and that is that when we go into youtube we see loads of people for example like uh, uh in american uh, uh youtube videos and stuff where they can keep bees with their, with, without gloves and stuff like that right without protective clothing and then got and then new new newbies i call them newbies they come and join us you know, they're like yeah let's go and farm bees without any, any gloves and i'm like no dude, you can't do that in this country anyway but it's mm -hmm. a misconception you know um, right. and in your case it's it's uh, conventional um, the preconception is a conventional does that sound better yes okay yeah um, that you know convention of thinking is that that's old school right it, it can't be done and right. and it's um, yeah you know let's let's skip it then you're not going to get right. building you're not going to get uh, building regulations for this right well, so, so in the US, there has been um, a push to create specific regulations for the different types of natural materials. Um, I don't know if that, has, if that push has been throughout the world, but I'll tell you, I've been doing this for over almost 25 years. I've been designing buildings. Every one of them has a normal building permit. Um, and for the first five years or so, I would need to go in and have a meeting at the permit office and educate them on why what we were suggesting met the building code. And right. I don't even do that anymore because they're all familiar with it now. So that has shifted just in the time that I've been doing this work, right? Um, yeah. But what just that education would look like is um, that first of all, I would go in with a collaborative attitude, not an aggressive attitude, mm -hmm. right? So my impression of building officials is that most people go in and confront them. And that's, if I'm confronted by something, I back up and I get defensive. And that's not what I want them to be. I want them to come to my side, right? So I go in and I'm collaborative. I tell them, I tell them why it meets the building code for energy efficiency. So insulation where it's needed, mass where it's needed. If I need to explain passive solar design, I explain that. Um, why the materials meet all of the fire safety codes, et cetera. And then I say to them, what questions do you have that I could answer or what information can I give to you that would allow you to accept that this meets the building code standard? Right. And that puts then the pressure off of them. So in the United yeah. States, there's, um, in order to, for a permit official to give you a permit 
for something that doesn't meet the building code or doesn't isn't shown to meet the building code, they take a personal liability. And what that means is if there is a failure in the building, the owner can sue that permit official individually. I see, in their personal right? capacity, right? Yeah. Yeah, so wow. That's you need to show them that they're, the pressure's off, that they're yeah. not gonna be litigated, Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So, but that's a fairly simple process. And now I have it down to like a little packet. I put it in with the drawings. Nobody ever reads it. It's, you know, but that's been over time. So the point is this, yeah. if, you, if you are in some other region, that's not the United States, but even if you're in the US, um, have a conversation first. Don't, don't build something illegal because they can require that you take it down. And that's heartbreaking, right? Yeah, um, that would be the worst, yeah. Worst outcome, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So don't do it illegally. That would be my, my personal advice. Um, <laughs> go meet with them and in a, in a collaborative manner, ask what information they need. And if it's information that you don't know how to find or you can't find it on Google, um, I know there's Barbara Jones in the, in the UK who does a lot of straw bale construction and other natural building. There's, um, oh, there's another woman, Becky, Becky Little, I believe is her name, who does a lot with clay. Um, there's lots of people who work with lime in the UK. Um, and if you still can't find it, feel free to send me a note on, um, I'm, I'm in a group on Facebook called Talking Natural Homes, and I'm happy to answer questions there. Um, so yeah, you can always post yeah. it there. And if I can answer it and send you a link to the information, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, that would be great. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. Are you guys still able to hear me? Yeah, but hold your, yeah. Yeah, is it better if I hold it up? Yeah. yeah weird. Yeah. Sometimes it's weird that it's doing this now. Yeah, go figure. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, How so our roads differ from in the US? Sure. Um, as far as I'm aware, if it's a permanent structure, it needs to go through the building code. And if it's not a permanent structure, it doesn't. In my personal opinion, um, anyone can claim they can do this building style, but without the research, the intention, and then the correct application of it, this can indeed be quite troublesome. Um, so I think, again, to get back to where you start from, where you said, like, start with anything, um, I would say start out with a non-permanent structure. So maybe just a little shed or whatever. So if it fails, then it fails, but you learn something from it so that you know how to do it better next time around. I'm, I'm not, okay, let's, let's say out of my personal perspective, I would not go and try and get a plan through on alternative materials um, based on just reading on and Googling and even, even great resources like you who've been doing it for decades. Um, the resource is great, but until you physically do it yourself, I don't think the problem solving will come in. Um, and I think if you could then uh, supply what you've already done successfully on let's say a smaller scale as a non-permanent structure then the probability of it then going through would most probably um be higher we're also in south africa so getting building plans <laughs> okay <laughs> is a little bit of a mission in itself. It's, yeah, um, right. Yeah, it's, it's two worlds, quite frankly, um, with regards to this and sharing the type of information that you're capable of sharing um, with your... Um, with it, American audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, yeah. it's different here. Um, but I think what one must remember is, and it's the same reason why a lot of people go like, oh no, you can't do this because it won't last because they might be aware of a structure that didn't last. I, I can think of many, many mud or clay structures that does not stand anymore. And that's what becomes your uh, reference, right? That's what, um, but it doesn't mean it was done in the correct manner. It remains a science and in order to um, perfect the science, it requires um, experience. Absolutely. And yeah. correct application, yeah. 
Yeah. So I, that goes back to my first mantra, which is like, don't, the first building you build should not be your house. No. <laughs> Please. Come Please. on, Shiggy man. Oh. <laughs> I want, that's not exactly what I was going to do. So <laughs> I have this. Out of my sails. <laughs> yeah, so I have this. I think I told you this story work, but it, it's, um, I call it my potholder project. You need to do a potholder project. Yeah. And the, so the story is this, I, I'll just do it fast, but so I wanted to learn how to knit as a child and my mom came up to me and, and well, I went to my mom and I said, I want to learn how to knit. And she said, great, you're going to make a potholder. And I was seven. I was like, I, I don't, I don't need a potholder. Like, what am I going to do with that? I yes. said, I'm making a sweater. Um, and she goes, oh, to her credit, she said, fine, make a sweater. Mm. And she got me the yarn and I started knitting and it is the most hilarious sweater you've ever seen. <laughs> One arm is long and skinny. The other arm is like a bell shape and wide and short yeah. and it's baggy and asymmetrical and hilarious and unwearable. Um, and my mom kept it. And the point is this, if I had started with the potholder, I would have sorted out how yes. to knit before I start of... with the, and so everyone needs a potholder project, right? Gotcha. Oh, that, right. That, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, what, um, we... I've actually, I've spoken to um, Tanya last week. Um, what I'm going to try and do for the group is set up a, a follow-up talk um, with Andy Horn from Cape Town. Now he's with, um, he's the principal at a company um, called um, Eco Design Architects. Now they specialize in um, natural building here in South Africa. So he can address the, the coding issues um, in more depth. Um, Look, the, yeah. the technique and the technology is the same, doesn't matter whether you're in the States or, the, or South Africa, um, but um, in a lot of areas, our building inspectors are still a little bit behind the, the curve um, and, and no amount of education will make them change their mind. Mm -hmm. At least um, but not I think for the moment, yeah, at least not yeah. maybe for now, but I mean, yeah. I think the more people try and push this type of thing, oh, absolutely. Real, you know, the, and the more kind of conversations we have this have like this, where people in, in, in the USA and in the UK, wherever we actually are, I mean, I, I think there's a bunch right. of people from all over the world that's on tonight, to, to, tonight or today, wherever you are, <laughs> um, you know, the better for everybody, because the bigger their exposure everywhere, bigger the exposure gets to wherever we are right yeah and then uh, so I, also I, found a saying, good, yeah. I also found a good resource just look on <clears throat> um the natural building groups and permaculture groups there's always people building something mm -hmm. and then just contact them and say listen can i come and spend a week with you and just i'm free labor and that's an amazing way to actually learn um yeah about the materials and techniques and it's a heck of a lot of fun as well. Yeah, and I think uh, I think Siggy Siggy's been involved with obviously all the projects that she's done in in America. But I think you tell us uh, thanks for that, Emil. Yeah, it's a great point, man. And we will we will mm -hmm. do a follow up uh, talk for the South African audience. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, which is going to be brilliant because I know Siggy Siggy mentioned that to us as well last week. She said, guys, also figure out somebody who's in South Africa. And I know Tanya spoke to you then about that, which was awesome. Mm -hmm um because local is lacquer as we would say which means otherwise <laughs> translated into local is cool you know local is awesome mm -hmm. so <laughs> keep it local naturally uh, with all your building materials and with uh learning the skills transfer and all that where, where possible right um right. but uh what i was going to say was that i think it's vital i mean siggy goes you go to italy i think you said every year or every second year or something tell us can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because there, there's also an exchange of exactly what we're talking about now, right? Mm -hmm. An exchange of skill, you know, t tell us a bit more about that trip, if you like. Yeah, so um, I've, I've gone for two years, and then this year we were supposed to go, but COVID got in the way, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're all infected now, so we can't go anywhere, it's Americans. So um, hopefully that will resume, and it's um, a permaculture farm in central Italy, 
um, that I've been collaborating with some architects who are natural architects um, in Italy. And they, um, so we've been collaborating on projects together over there and I come and teach a class usually three or four days um, yeah. with them and they translate to Italian for the Italian speakers. And, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you, but you guys, I mean, I, if I'm not mistaken, you know, they, I think you mentioned that a lot of people come from all over the place, right? To that kind of yeah. event, to that event. Yeah. And, yeah. So we've, table, um, we've had people practice. from, yeah, we've had people from the UK, obviously from uh, Romania, from Africa, from, I mean, all over Europe, Switzerland, yeah. um, all over. Yeah. 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 It's really nice. It's a nice, diverse crowd yeah it's yeah. got to be exciting man because it's not it's not just yeah. going to be about the building it's going to be about the cultures and the, and the right. characters and the personalities and all that and stuff. the food the oh, food the is food. so good yeah <laughs> but i wanted yeah. to can i back up wine, once we're in italy right oh and the wine. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah oh my gosh Sorry, no it's so ridiculous you, you wanted to add oh so um one thing i just wanted to say about um the sort of approval process. I think one of the things that at least the mistakes that I notice here is people wanting to use the wrong material for the wrong application. And then they don't meet the energy efficiency requirements um, and they don't get approval. And they think the reason they're not getting approval is because it's a natural alternative material. And that wasn't the case. And what I mean by that is this, when you look into the world, right, of at materials, um, heavy materials tend to be what's called a thermal mass, and those materials can absorb and retain heat energy. So they're like um, a battery for heat energy, a rechargeable battery. Um, Filo, di, Filo di Paglia, yes, exactly, that's the one, whoever that's chatted one, that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that <laughs> And the, the light materials that you find in nature, so it tends to be the fibers, the light materials have little air pockets and those tend to be insulators. Um, and the sort of exception that's not a fiber would be things like pumice or perlite or vermiculite. Those are all you know, mineral based, um, but they have air pockets and they're lightweight and they are insulating. Um, and if, so here we have requirements for insulation values because if you don't have enough insulation and you try to heat your home in winter, that heat is exiting your home. Right, yeah, makes sense. And if you have insulation, you hold it in like a bubble. Um, and so here what happens often, a misconception is people trying to get a clay-based building permitted it doesn't meet the R value requirements for energy efficiency. It doesn't meet the insulation requirements. And they think, oh, you can't do natural building. And no, they just needed to choose hempcrete or straw bale or something that was insulating um, and then keep the clay on the inside. So you have mass inside the building, you have an insulation bubble on the outside of the building, and now you have a super energy efficient building. So that was the only other thing is the needing to understand the properties, the thermal properties of the materials you're choosing and use them then appropriately for each application. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, it's, so, yeah, okay. So if I'm hearing you right, it's basically figure out the conditions that you're at and what you have locally available and then match what you have locally available if it applies to your conditions. Yeah? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. So if yeah. we've got wet conditions, you're going to have very different application of material to if you have dry conditions is that right not so, necessarily different materials but you would then okay. have different details right got you okay so, so that's also something to consider is, right yeah so if you just look at roofs from around the world mm -hmm. if you look at older buildings and by older i mean anything that's 150 years or older and you just look at the roofs of those buildings you can tell how much rainfall they get or how much snow they get right Flat roofs tend to be in arid climates that are collecting rain from the roof. What little rain comes, it collects it on the roof. If it's a really snowy climate, the roofs are really highly pitched, mm -hmm. right? So that the snow sheds off. off. Yeah. If it rains a lot, the eaves are deep, right? So we already know all of this. Mm. 
we just <laughs> need to apply that thinking back to how we build again. And we've stopped doing that. We've let technology take over instead of smart design. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then, so, so tell us, I mean, I think I'm, uh, I'd like to know, like, what is your, I've seen loads of your photos and I'm a big fan of your, of your page. So, you know, oh, I, I've you. been around for a long time and well done for all of that work. Cause I know that takes a lot of time too. Right. Um, and, uh, but I want to know, uh, share with us like you know one of your favorite projects and give us one of your and why and all that and then give us the run about what one of your you know one of the ones that was just a real maybe a devil in the details kind of project so we can just pick a pick a little bit out into that you know yeah so, so the first one's easier to answer than the I second think so, one yeah yeah <laughs> You don't have to name um, names, by the way. I'm not asking you to name. No, no, no. I just, <laughs> I, I'm hard pressed to think of one in the second category. All right. Well, um, let's take your time while you're answering for the first one. There we go. That's right. Use up all the time for that. Yeah. So, the one of I, I have, I have a few favorite projects, but the one I would use as an example is, um, it's a small, so 650 square feet. So what is that? Um, 65 square meters. Is that right? Yeah. Is that it's, small? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty small, but yeah. It's yeah. About that, I yeah. Think. Give or take. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it, and it's this, uh, it's an adorable little round structure. And the reason it was so wonderful to me is that the whole building was built with people who had never built anything before. The whole thing, start to finish. And the reason that was possible was that we did workshops. So I came and taught. So each time we were starting something new, I came and I taught that technique and we'd have a bunch of people get it started. And I would also be training the homeowners and their family. Right. And then I would go away, they would finish, and then I would come back and teach the next step, right? And there's this unbelievable empowerment that happens and a different connection that you have to this building that I think conventional construction can't achieve, right? There's, this, there's no disconnect between who built it, how it was built, decisions that were made. It's all, it's all one entity, one person, one family, right? Um, and so, and I'm like, I'm still in contact with them. I'm still in contact with people who came to those workshops because it was wow. so life altering for some of them. And there's this in, exceptional pride of walking away from a finished plaster wall, having never picked up a trowel and plastered a wall before, right? Yeah. And then being able to plaster and have the walls look so beautiful and step back and go, oh, I did that, you know, or we did that. And <laughs> so that's probably my, my favorite in that sense, because it's singularly the best example of just how empowering natural building can be. Yeah, I um, love that. That's great. Sorry. When did you guys build that then? I mean, it sounds like it was over a period of time, but sort of what year what it was um if my memory serves i have a terrible concept of time i believe it was 2011 so about right. nine years ago um and we started in may and we finished in september right okay is that a, is it i mean okay so here's another question then okay um i don't know let's say a 650 square foot which is what give it say give it take 60 square meters maybe somebody can work mm -hmm. that out for us while we're busy chatting and post it on <laughs> Post it on for us, you know. <laughs> take take two too many seconds to figure it out for us and, and post it on the chat for us um, so we can relate. But um, what kind of timeline are we talking about then? From kind of like a to, um, and here I am giving you a bit more time to think about that second one, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the what sort of timeline would we normally, you know, yeah. put to that from the kind of conception stage? Because I've seen you build, like, I've seen you also part of, I think it's part of maybe your workshops as well, that you actually show the guys how to take the concept uh, before actually even, like, building anything, right? Anything. 
it. Concrete is concrete. So, that, you know, anything <laughs> physically out there is that they, <laughs> that you get them to build a model. Is that, I mean, walk us through, do you want to walk us through that a little bit, little, you know, from conception through to that, through to going outside, getting the materials through to, yeah. Do you, do you want to give us a, a the CD, yeah. CD walk through on that if you like? Uh, yes. So the design part, usually I do the models, but. Um, Thanks. David says it is 60 square meters. So I was pretty much on. Oh, excellent. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you for you were, doing you that. Were 65, 60, uh, who cares? I know, I know it's <laughs> approximately divide it by is. 10, but exactly. yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, yeah. So I have a kind of a unique um, design process that again, I call it collaborative design. So. Um, and I do usually, not with every client, but I do usually have some kind of a model that I build with them or for them, and then we play with it. Um, but I think anyone designing their own space, a model is a great way to understand how light plays through windows. Um, it's good at, if you, if you build a model to scale, and then you take a camera and get down to eye level with the lens and take a photograph and then look at the photograph instead of the model, it erases the, the scale and you can sort of see what it will look like completed. Wow, I love that. That's it's a little a, that's, tricky that's learn in architecture school. That's yeah. Nugget, thank you. Yeah. Wow, that's brilliant, love that. So design process, you know, it, there's pre-designed plans that you could get tomorrow. Um, if you design something custom with somebody, then that's usually a four to six month process by itself. Mm. And then um, construction time, it's sort of, the, it depends, right? So um, How long I've is had, the spring, right? Yeah, so most of the contractor projects that I've done, in other words, there's a contractor in charge of making sure the plumber shows up on time, putting up the roof, you know, all this sort of big things. Um, those typically take about a year to construct. Right. Um, okay. Even if there's some participation from owners, right, or workshops. Yeah. Um, when I work with owner builders, if it's really the scale of a normal larger home, um, so more like 100 square meters or bigger, um, then it, you, most owner builders do a three-year process. So wow. the first... Okay. Yeah, so, and this is because most people can't just stop their job, right? True. So they're, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. they're usually doing it summers or weekends or, you know. It's like a side hustle, yeah, okay. Yeah, so if the first year you focus on the skeleton of the building and getting the roof on and dried in, so it's basically a pavilion. And then the second year, fill in the walls and shape all the clay and, you know, close it in, it's called, right? So right. windows go in. And, Right. And then the third year, focus on the beautiful finishes that you want, putting Finish. any cabinets in, all of that. Right. Yeah. I love all and this. If, oh, hmm? No, go ahead. So I was going to say on, on the finishing side, I mean, uh, you know, you, you posted so many great, uh, fantastic looking like sculptures and uh, the, the shelves that can go inside into a building, the fireplaces. That's amazing stuff. So I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize how much scope there is right yeah so i mean all right so guys you got to go have a look at uh, uh you know if you if you aren't familiar already with siggy's stuff go and check it out i mean check your website check your instagram out buildnaturally.com yeah yeah um uh but um are we getting to the point where i think we might want to go into frequently asked questions at this stage and yeah. um oh we've only just a couple of people are only just joining us now. It's a bit late. Uh, welcome to Stinny and Thomas, wherever you guys are from. Um, welcome to the group. But something I, I, I think we, we, we also spoke about this uh, uh, previously, um, and, and that's the conception behind the cost. So, 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 so something like a 60 square meter place, right? Depending on uh, taking all, all of the factors, you know, whatever factors we may purport to know from what you and understand from what you've explained so far. That could go into a building like this. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from the, you know, the free labor portion, which is cool, uh, especially if you can get friends and family and kids involved and all that. Mm -hmm. Odd, uh, you know, um, 
you know, person, odd, you know, outside person you might have to get in just simply because of plumbing or whatever the case is. What do we, what, what would you sort of say is, is, um, is the cost involved here? How, how would you compute a cost per, would you, could you, could you give somebody like an idea of per square meter, similar to kind of like conventional building? Would that be the easiest way of doing it? Or, or let me leave that to you. You, yes. you, you nail, you, you go with it. How, how yeah, do you so it's defined, yeah? The thing with cost is that there are so, so, so many variables that it's right. impossible to say this is the range. It's yeah. not even possible, but um, I'm not going to cop out that badly. Um, ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the sort of one sentence answer is um, if you build the exact same interior space and you build it with the exact same type of labor force, in other words, either volunteer or paid or a combination, then it will cost the same as it would if it were conventionally built. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that's my one sentence. Um, and then, I mean, I can only do dollars per square foot. I can't no, translate no, no, both that's fine, of course. money yeah, and yeah. square footage. That's asking too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so keep, the, keep it to square footage. It's fine. Yeah. yeah so the other sort of, out. yeah, right. Okay. So the other sort of rule of thumb is that a conventional construction is about 50% materials and about 50% labor cost. Right. And natural building is more like 75% labor cost and 25% material cost. Okay. And well, so that what, that, what that means is that, and, and the labor in conventional construction is highly skilled labor. Yeah, specialized, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you don't have experience setting concrete forms or building stud walls or whatever masonry, then, you know, the odds that you're going to participate in a meaningful way to offset that labor cost are zil to none. Um, but natural building, you can learn in a few hours or a day, depending on how complicated the method is, um, which means you can participate in a meaningful way to reduce up to 75% of your building cost. Yeah. Right? That's significant. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's mostly you're not going to reduce it down to zero because I know like here you have to have a licensed plumber, you have to have a licensed electrician. So there's probably still some trades that you're hiring out. Um, but that's where when you see examples of people who have built these amazing structures for almost nothing, that's why. It's because they sweat their little butts off and put in time. And that time was labor. Right, so sweat equity to construct yeah. and that reduces the total cost. So the range of projects that I've done and someone can convert this, but so I'll do it in cost per square foot is anything from about $50 per square foot to over $350 per square foot. Wow. And that's the range. So, and that's because I work with owner builders and I work with extremely high-end clients who, when I ask them what their budget is, they're like, well, whatever it's going to cost, you know. We do um, it and let's get on with it, yeah. <laughs> That's Brilliant. rare, but it happens. Sign me up. Sign me up. Yes. <laughs> I <Yeah>. want you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, right. you know, that's kind of the normal range and yeah. 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 All right. So I think, the, so, so, so all right, I'm going to push you now. What, what was that one project on, on that one that you didn't like, or that was raising, you know, was a bit of a devil in the details. Oh, Have you got I mean, one? it's, there's, the thing is, there's not one project where I could say yeah. that's, that encapsulates that project, but I've had things that have happened on various projects. The, the most frightening thing that ever happened had nothing to do with natural building, um, but the, the builder didn't follow the plans on how the floor was framed. And these structures, so most buildings in the US are what's called stud construction. So there's the little post here and a little post there and they're really close together, right? And when I'm designing natural buildings, they're what's called post and beam, which is a bigger post here and a bigger post way over there and a beam that spans between them. And when you do the second floor, there has to be a continuous block that goes all the way down. You can't just have a beam sitting on top of air. Right. And he yeah. built the second floor with the beam sitting on top of air. 
Oh. And then we put in heavy straw bales and heavy clay plaster, and we put a heavy slate roof on it, and the wall went like this. Buckled. Yeah. yeah. And it almost collapsed, and I happened to have been there, and so I had him push a tractor up against the wall, and we had an engineer come and um, yeah. fix it. Fix it. Yeah. Right. That's the most stressful thing that's ever happened. But yeah, okay. for the most part, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I'm figuring, I think it's probably quite difficult. I know this is a bit of a pushy one, that one. But I'm glad I, I brought it up because I think, I've, I'm, I've, I find if you, if you haven't, I'm sure that from what I've seen on your, on your, on your site, that if, as long as somebody knows what they're doing and they're following the guidelines, they're following the building code, and they're mixing the right materials for the right application, that's, none of that stuff should happen, right? Exactly. Yeah. On the nose. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Yep. All right. Awesome. And what is something that, what's the biggest project you've done? Like tall wise, like, cause some people are like, oh, you can't go double story, you know, okay. building with clay. You know right. what I mean? Like, what's, well, your, what's tell, tell us about your biggest one and then we'll open up. for. for uh, yeah. So mostly I'm doing straw bale buildings with lots of clay inside, right? Because I work in a climate that has four seasons. So we definitely have three to six months of heating, right? Um, right. But the tallest clay building, I want to say, is 14 stories tall in Whoa. Northern Africa. Yeah, it's hundreds of years old. Um, it's insanity personified. It's so can beautiful. We, can we can we have a can we hold a uh, competition quickly and see if people can guess which country that's in before you tell us? And I don't know. So <laughs> somebody needs yeah, to just find it. Google. Nobody's allowed to Google this. You got to kind of guess it, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I would have to Google um, it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the notion that you can't do multiple stories is just absolutely false. So, um, yeah, it's cool. but it's with with any wall system, it's about how are you bracing it to make sure that it is stable, right? So you can't just build one single wall that's really tall and straight and long, right? That's inherently not a stable shape. So it needs some kind of buttressing or cross pieces to keep it from falling over or it needs to be fatter at the bottom and skinny at the top it's called a battered wall right so you have or curved curves are super strong um wow. right and so understanding all of those things so the the biggest project is is actually um i have a client who's that's a vineyard um and we've done we've done four four buildings so far and we're building another one now and then another one next year and another one the year after and those are huge. So they're like the one now is, it's 7,500 square feet. So. Wow. Yeah, that's seven. 750, 740 meters, probably square meters. meters. Yeah. 700 square meters, yeah. That's yeah, like, and that's the warehouse, you know, that's over. That's it's a warehouse, warehouse yeah. yeah. Cool. It's a straw bale warehouse with clay plaster inside and lime plaster outside and a living roof on top. Wow. Yeah. All right. So Holger has got a question. Great. Can, uh, can we just uh, talk a little bit about different basements, floor construction types, and perhaps uh, some recommendations per region, depending on where you are in the world? So, that? yeah. So a ba basement. Basements and floor structures. Yeah. Yeah. So a basement. Um, the only natural material that you can use to, so a basement has a retaining wall, right? Cause you're building down and then you need to hold the earth back. Um, and a nat the natural material that you would need to use for a retaining wall has to be something that you could throw in a lake, leave it there for a year, come back a year later and still take it out of the lake. And it looks the same as when you threw it in. If it, if you take a ball of clay and you throw it into a lake, it's not gonna be there in two weeks, right? So, so the material that qualifies is stone, Okay. right? So, um, and then in terms of foundations, um, the one I use most frequently is called a rubble trench foundation. Um, and I can send you an article on that too. I also have a how-to on rubble trench foundations because that's the other, but basically picture that you're digging down to whatever, ground freezes, it's called the frost depth. You're digging a width that has to do with how heavy the building is and what the load cap bearing capacity of your soil is. So picture how wide would your raft need to be to hold up the weight of what you're gonna put on it, right? 
Um, so depth is frost, width is bearing capacity. Um, and then you fill it with gravel and you tamp the gravel to lock it in place. And now you have a drain underneath your whole foundation. Right. And that means there's no water underneath your whole foundation. And because water is the only thing that's bigger when it's a solid, so ice is bigger, the, bigger in volume than water, the ground actually heaves in winter and it moves a whole building. But if there's no water there to freeze, it can't move your building. Right. right. That's why. Right? That's gonna be Yeah, bad. and it's yeah. cheaper. It doesn't need concrete, although if you use concrete, it's a fraction of the, the total that you would normally use. Um, and concrete is one of the most uh, carbon intensive building materials. Um, and it, it's the only foundation that doesn't ever move because there is no water. So. All right, and that you said was a rubble. Rubble, right? rubble trench foundation, yeah. Oh All yeah, right. whoever wrote that, Holger, yes, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> and I see Yanni, Yanni, uh, I'm assuming he's from South Africa and in South Africa. Uh, he's talking about 104 square meters Ford Earth House that they're doing, and they've uh, people people that haven't seen it. Uh, he's saying that they've done 12 months, they're 12 months into it, in the final stretch at the moment, or the final stretch. So well done wow. to you guys. Yeah. Yeah, that'd That's be awesome. brilliant. That's brilliant, man. Congrats. Have you got any questions on 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 any any part you guys are busy doing there, Yanni, uh, with with that house that that Siggy might be able to help you out with? We'll let you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. Go for it. Hi. You um, want me to? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we. Yeah, sorry, we are busy with the house now, and um, yeah, it's an amazing journey we've been on. It's only my wife and I and the and the children building the house. Okay. So, cool. yeah. It, we are glad to hear we can take three years. Yeah, we we are quite glad to hear that it for other people it takes three years to get where we are in one year now. So we've been pushing it. Um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think someone else asked a question a bit earlier. Um, Ziggy, would you do a, a hybrid house uh, rather to, um, and I mean, different elements on different sides um, for the um, isolation and, and the thermal mass on the other side? Um, because in, in our climate, um, the sun comes in from the north side, and so our, our house is facing north. Um, so would you say put the, the rammed earth on the say on the northern side and the um, straw bale on the southern side? Do, would you look at, at factors like that? Um, sometimes. And the, the, when I would say yes would require these factors. One, that you have at least 300 sunny days a year, if not 330 sunny days a year. Um, and particularly that you have that sun when it's cold out. And two, that you're in a temperate climate. So temperate climate means um, it might be cold enough that you put the heat on, but if you didn't, you wouldn't freeze to death, right? Um, so otherwise what I do is I build on that. So for you, north facing, for us, south facing. So equ the equator facing, wall, I use glass, and then a mass wall. So I pull the mass inside, okay. oh. right, and then insulate the rest of the bubble. And the reason is that mass is going to cool equally from all sides. But if the outside is substantially colder, right, so if it's um, zero Celsius or below, the heat will dissipate more quickly to that cold side than to the warm side inside. And you won't actually be able to capture and use the heat to the interior space. But if you make a bubble, so put glass there and even better bonus points for putting um, some kind of a quilted fabric, it can just be heavy drapes even, that you close at night. Then when the, the sun warms your mass, right? You the sun goes away at night, you close your drapes, and now that heat dissipates into only interior space. And then it's the maximum benefit. So that's oh. how I do it. Um, yeah, and in, in the climate where I am, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever just do mass on the south facing. So for you, more facing wall. 
but we're, we're, we might be a more, we might have harsher winter than you have, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah in general, I think, in general, you would, at least when we do have winter and summer, it, it can get under, you know, below zero Celsius, can do that, but it's for a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. you know, it's usually about six, within about a, a range of six weeks or so. Uh, okay. in most cases you know where it does get to minus 10 minus 15 in rare cases it's mm -hmm. for very short periods of time mm -hmm. the rest of the time we're looking at about anywhere between sort of minus two minus three ranging up to about th even double figures during winter you know mm -hmm. 10 11 12 i mean the bottom the, the bottom line answer is that you can never go wrong with insulation but you can go wrong with mass Right. So if you're not sure what you're, and I mean the exterior walls, um, if you are not sure, the, the, the one scenario that works everywhere is insulation outside, lots of mass inside. Yeah. And then no matter what your climate, it, that will work. We, we, um, um, we opted to go for the whole house with Ramda. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we don't go below, below zero in winter. With right. above that, and, but, so and that's we've, why. Um, yeah, and, uh, and we've um, because we've situated quite well north. We the the roof overhangs are like um, putting a lot of shade in the summer, and, and in the right. winter it, it opens up so the sun can shine in again. So yeah, yeah. So it's, but, but yeah, it's amazing to talk to you and and to yeah, we also follow you on Instagram, all those things. Oh, thanks. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, we've we've got a lot of inspiration from what you've been doing as well. Oh, Thanks. nice. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I like your rammed earth in the background there. Very nice. Oh, thank you. That, <laughs> that was our small project. We, um, we started off on a three by four. Yeah. See? Um, Great. So, yeah, exactly. so we still, yeah, the, Making we still need to move into the other house. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Good. Perfect. Thanks for your question, yeah. Danny. And good luck, man. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right, so we've also got one from Chelsea. She says, thanks for the clear and helpful advice. Uh, question is, might be too specialized, but she says, uh, have you ever dealt with building on the shady side of a mountain? Moderate climate, Northern California, so it is in your kind of neck, you know, your part of yeah. the world. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on a steep slope. Are there drying issues and or foundation issues? Are there potential natural solutions to those? So. Yeah, the foundation is going to be the trickiest biscuit there. And um, I can't legally give you foundation advice because if it fails, you can sue me. And so I'm not going to do that. But okay. um, that the one things, then. yeah, so the things to think about when you're on a steep slope, um, there are, there's, you have to pin to the slope. You have to pin to the um, slope of the, you know, whether it's stone or clay or whatever, you have to actually connect into the to the earth. Um, the second thing in Northern California is in you're in an earthquake zone. So you need something that pins to the slope that is also earthquake proof. Um, yeah, so there's a solution to that. It has nothing to do with natural building. It is conventional. Um, and so any structural engineer can help you do that. Once you build a platform, um, so you've connected to your slope, yeah, if you're definitely. fully shaded, I would insulate, 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 insulate. Okay. Um, yeah, because cool. insulation keeps the inside the same temperature all the time. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, Adele, or I think it's actually Emil. Um, he's asking about uh, the lime for Tedelect. Premixes yeah. aren't available in South Africa and might be elsewhere. What mm -hmm. does one use? What type of lime does one use? Are there different kinds of lime? There are, so yeah. when I teach this as a class, I spend about three hours just explaining the different kinds of lime. Goodness, all right, so we don't have time um, for that. Well, <laughs> so, but what I can tell you is that the original Tadillac was made with a high calcium lime, but that was very low temperature fired. So it had a lot of um, impurities in it. Um, in the US, the thing that's closest is something called type S lime, but I don't think you have that everywhere. That's like a pressure, it's, it's an autoclave pressure lime that um, is usually only used when you have low uh, calcium content in your lime. Anywhere, if you can get high calcium lime, so, and what that means is chemically, it's as pure calcium hydroxide as possible. 
calcium hydroxide. If you can't get that and you can get quick lime, then look up how to safely make calcium hydroxide from quick lime. It's, it's very dangerous, so look it up and make a small batch first, um, but that will give you high calcium, calcium hydroxide, and that you can use for Tidal Act. All right. Uh, and then have you, you've answered the Rubble Trench Foundation question, so thanks for that. That's awesome. Absolutely. Think. Brilliant. Yeah. I think that also covers the what size of gravel, um, I'm assuming. And then as an architect teacher, what do you hope your legacy will be? Ooh, this is, a, this is interesting. Uh, now we're getting nitty. <laughs> okay, as far as I'm aware, you are the only architect in the world whoop, whoop, uh, who yeah. we have on our chat. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> who publishes and does your work in hands on way. Do you hope more architects would, would, would want to do that? Yeah. Oh, I, think, uh, I mean, the, the last part isn't easy. Yes, I wish more. I wish more architects were hands on. Um, I'm not the only architect who does hands-on work, just yeah, FYI. Yeah, we, um, uh, so there's lots of them. Most of them that I know of are natural builders. Um, go figure. Um, like the, the, the people I collaborate with in Italy, they are architects that also do construction. So for, as an example. Yeah. Um, legacy, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, mainstream, that natural building is normal, right? Yeah. So we have this perception that it's this weirdo, you know, thing that only nutty people do and the Hipp big fat hippies, bulls. Hippies yeah. growing edibles in their backyard, you know. Right, and you know what? <laughs> if that's who you are, more power to you yeah, and you can build naturally. And tell but, me when I can come over as well, please. Totally, absolutely. <laughs> But it shouldn't be exclusionary, right? It should be something that no matter what your income status is and no matter what your um, aesthetic desires are, there's a way to do that naturally. And that's what I wish, that that was the go-to, not the extreme or alternative solution. But I'm not gonna create that as a legacy, but I will push toward that always, always. Well, you know, that's the thing. And I think talks like this is, is exactly what would help that move into that direction, you know? Because more and more people are talking about it. More and more, more and more people are like, what is this, you know, what is natural building? How can I use it? How do I test it out? And I think having having uh, ambassadors like you, Cities, and, you know, very down to earth and loving your, your passion and your purpose, mm -hmm. bringing it to the people like this is, you know, what else can we ask for really mm. in a master architect that wants to build naturally so i'm i'm going to say thank you on behalf of everybody oh no we've run out of time we've run over time and if people want to stay and if you're happy to stay a little bit longer we maybe you've got another 10 15 minutes i don't know if you do um, yeah, I yeah i just want to if say thanks interest, for people sure. who perhaps need to start going if, you know if that's the case for them but i just wanted to say thanks on all all of our behalves for joining us for doing mm -hmm. the great work that you have been doing and hopefully we can maybe, you know, have another another chat maybe that gets a little bit more uh, specific on some of the things or answer questions that we haven't been able to today. I don't know. We'll, we'll chat. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you're free to still chat a bit longer? I could, yeah. 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 All right. If there's so, more questions, I'm happy to answer them. There are a few. So uh, let's see. Um, somebody's talking about roundwood timber frame. Is this possible with cottonwood poplar? I'm not sure if that's something in your scope. Do you build or have have you built a round wooden timber frame? I don't know if that's... Uh... Yes. Yeah. So I'm just going to clarify the terminology. Um, so round wood means you're using the tree without milling it into a square or rectangle, right? So when uh, you look at the cross section, you see the tree, right? Kind of like um, a, log, a log cabin type of scenario, right? Yeah. Sort of. Well, so then timber framing specifically refers to a type of post and beam construction where the interlocking joints between the posts and the beams or the rafters um, don't use any metal fasteners. So they're mortise and tenon together and then pegged and, and that creates like a locked joint. And there's, I mean, there's a whole art to that. Right. That particular trade I don't teach, but I do design projects that use round timbers. Um, right. And I and do also design timber frame structures. However, 
it's very costly to have it be timber frame with round timbers. So unless I have a client who's either going to learn it themselves or who um, has an infinite Lives on a forest. Yeah, the right. Next exactly. forest that they want to utilize or tap into as a resource. Yeah, cool. Exactly. Um, yeah. Cottonwood popular poplar is that something you'd recommend or something? I think that's specifically they're asking about that. I don't know if that's anything you know. Say that about. one more time. Is what Pop popular? Cot cottonwood poplar wood. Oh, longevity cottonwood poplar. And, and, and longevity. I think that's where they. Yes. Yeah, so any almost any wood can be used structurally, but um, what you if you're not sure about the species of wood you're using, you'd want to either look up. Um, there are tables online that that uh, rate the different structural capacity of different wood. For posts, almost anything works because a post um, it seems like the thing that should be biggest, but it's usually the thing that needs to be the smallest. Mm -hmm. The thing that needs to be big and strong is the beam. Right? right, because it's over air and it's holding a whole floor or a whole roof or both, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's where the significant load is. So right. the beams usually are what need to be big and strong. Um, and right. if you're still not sure, I would just talk to a structural engineer. They can calculate for different species mm -hmm. um, how big each member needs to be in your structure. Okay, thanks for that one. A great question. Uh, we've got one. We've got Emily. I'm uh, trying to find. Emily, she wants to, oh, there she is, right. Okay, so go for it, Emily. Uh, Hi, yeah. Um, Hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying Where are you to, from? Uh, I'm from uh, Southern Appalachia, USA, North Carolina. Ah, cool. Welcome, welcome. The neighbors. <laughs> hey. We're yeah. neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm actually from New Jersey, so I fo I've followed you for a long time, Siggy. Um, awesome. And I really appreciate you, yeah, like how, how often you reply to people on the natural building networks and just how selfless you are and how, yeah, you're just like not an end user. You're just trying to like disperse information. So I just want to tell you how much I do that. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'm wondering if you can try to, I don't really understand how um, natural homes, like, so, you know, the, the insulation is, if you could just kind of describe like temperature versus moisture and how, you know, so like the, these homes are known to be breathable, but how do they keep the heat in, in the winter and vice versa in the summer? Like I can't intuitively, I understand that, but I need, I can't describe that when someone asks me that question. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder yeah. if you could help me out on that. Okay, right, so right. that is, it's a great question. And I'm gonna first just change one word. And that's the word breathable. It is the word that is used in, in building codes. It is the word that is used um, at least in the US, I think also in Canada, I think also in the UK. And it is a very confusing word. I'm gonna replace the word breathable with the word vapor permeable. Okay. Right? So breathable does not mean that your walls, Right? It doesn't mean air flows through. It doesn't mean there's air leakage at all. It means that moisture that is in the air, right? As opposed to liquid moisture, right? So vapor bound moisture right. can travel freely through the materials very slowly, right? Okay. That is completely different from airflow moving through. Airflow needs a gap. Airflow needs a hole. It needs a pipeway. The moisture travels through the material. So okay. then I'll just describe, I'm, I'm going to simplify it to um, insulation versus mass. And by insulation, I mean hempcrete, straw bale, mostly cordwood, mostly um, light clay straw if it's done right. So those insulating materials versus mass materials, which I'm going to call clay plasters, lime plasters. Okay. Um, clay is hygroscopic. Hygroscopic means it absorbs humidity, holds it. So when the humidity is over 50%, it pulls humidity out of the air. Which is amazing, Breathe. right? Because honey does the same thing. So I've heard that name exactly. too. I've heard that, yeah. that, that too. It's amazing, right? If you leave honey open, it does exactly the same thing. 
right? Yeah. It pulls the moisture too, right? Yeah, and then it can ferment. And that's how mead was made in the first place oh. back in whenever it took place thousands of years ago. So I, I got to send you a bottle of my mead that I'm making, Siggy, okay? okay? But anyway, deal. carry on, carry on. That's a deal, that's a deal. <laughs> Um, right, so the, the clay never becomes wet, but it's absorbing above 50%, it's absorbing that humidity and holding it, right? When the humidity is lower than 50%, it releases that, right? So think of it as, you know, in a, and I think that's why it gets the word breathable, right? Because it can pull and release like a lung, but it's never feels wet, it's never, you're never re-wetting the wall ever, ever, right? As opposed to a material that is not breathable where humidity can condense on it, which means it goes from vapor to liquid. Now it's a liquid on the surface. Then you have persistent moisture over time if that happens enough. And what happens when you have persistent moisture over time is two things. One is mold growth and the other is rotting. Neither of those are good. So if you just prevent condensation and allow the vapor to flow freely, you will never have an issue. Humidity by itself, if it can never become liquid, if it can never condense back into a liquid, humidity by itself will not cause a problem. Does that clarify that piece? Yes, so much. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so, and then the mass versus insulation is that mass is a, is like that rechargeable battery. So when there is a heat input, it can be the sun, it can be uh, a fire, it can be really hot air, right? So the summertime, right? Um, when the, there is a heat input that is warmer than the mass, the mass is drawing heat in. And when the surrounding conditions are lower temperature and there is no heat input, it releases that energy, right? So just like you know your phone, when it's plugged in, you have an energy input and it's charging. And when it's unplugged and you're using it, it's an energy drain. It's the same thing with the mass, but with heat energy, right? Yeah. So if you take mass and put it on either side of an insulator, right? The insulator is the opposite. The insulator just blocks the flow of temperature, right? So heat energy is, is impeded from flowing through that space as opposed to absorbing and capturing and then releasing. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you have that insulation and then you have this mass on either side, the mass is trying to come to equilibrium on both sides of that insulation. Right. The insulation is blocking this mass and this mass from coming to equilibrium, which means the mass outside comes to equilibrium outside and the mass inside comes to equilibrium inside. Right. And the thicker the mass, the longer the stretch of time that you can average to create that equilibrium. Does awesome. that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Super. Yeah, thank you so much, Siggy. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. All right. That was a great question. It was a great um, question. <clears throat> all right. So quickly as well, we've got one from Sabino from Portland, actually, Oregon. Uh, okay. USA. Uh, it's a her understanding that um, earthen or lime plaster walls are quite fire resistant, but the roof is vulnerable to embers. How do we protect the roof from fire, uh, uh, and depending on the type of roof? We've had unprecedented wildfires, which I think is an issue for a lot of people around in California, right? Uh, LA, even Australia, etc. cetera. Um, uh, West coast of USA. So I'm thinking ahead about designing for this increased fire frequency. What, what yeah. we... Uh, Whoa, it's a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a, it's, a longer answer for that one, maybe. Or what? It's just a really, really, really tough um, problem to solve. Mm. And the reason is that, um, so Portland, for example, is a wet area. So you want good roof overhang, right? You want a hat with a good rim to keep the rain off. But that means you have some structural element that's supporting that eave. And that thing is probably wood or maybe steel, 
neither of which work in a fire. So as a rule of thumb, steel is horrible in a fire because it actually deforms and fails. So steel is the worst. Um, and then if it's wood, the bigger the wood, the more fire resistant. And the reason is the outside of the wood chars wow. and prevents the inside of the wood from burning. So if you can do something with massive timbers as opposed to small sticks, right? So instead of just regular two by rafter framing, mm -hmm. if you can use timbers, that would be better, but you know, the whole forest is on fire. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, the other thing would be from an ember standpoint would be to put a living roof on it. Yeah. Right. And then you have soil, which can't burn and you have plants, which could dry out, but they're keeping your roof cool. Right. Um, yeah. But it would take a lot for those to burn as well. So um, that's where I would go to prevent embers. But know that if the fire comes through, you're probably going to lose at least your roof. Lose, yeah. Yeah. All right. And then quickly, we've got one from Chuck saying, uh, thoughts on hempcrete? I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier on. What's your take? Thumbs up, um, thumbs down. Yeah, so I love it. Um, the only reason I don't use it more is cost. So where we are in the US, um, the growth, the growing hemp as a product is heavily regulated and not legal everywhere. So it's difficult to get it and it's expensive here. Okay. Kind of, and it, an opportunity for South Africans, guys. You yeah. To make hempcrete and ship it out to the US. Go for it. And Be a 200, 200 years ago, it was our number one product, what? actually. Yeah. Wow. That's and now, who, who, yeah. who but it's about? great. It's It has different parameters. So, um, straw bale is a monolithic wall system. So, what that means is it's just one continuous self supporting wall system. Uh, hempcrete requires cavities that you fill in. There's hemp block, but it's not as good because um, there's little air gaps in between each block. So um, I would build it in situ completely, but it usually requires that you do like a double stud framed wall. So there's a lot more wood required to do a hempcrete wall, but that's the main reason I don't use it is just cost. So, oh, but all right. yeah, I don't know the nature of the question, but if, I mean, that's my generic answer. Cool, <laughs> there's cool. some follow up. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we've got one about uh, we've got one that's talking about wimbles. I'm not sure how. Uh, I don't know if if, if a renewable energy source it, potentially Aphrodite Aphrodite. Do you want to re uh, elaborate on that? And where are they located? With windmills, yeah. Can I? I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Yeah. There Hi, we go. There you are. Hi. Hi. Where are you from? And go for it. I'm, I'm in Cyprus in the Mediterranean. Hey, congrats. I Welcome. warm here most of the months. Uh, my question is uh, mostly about the material of a windmill. Uh, mm. Is it possible to, is it um, strong enough with clay? Because I know that it, we have to have water underneath. Um, anything you could share about that? What yeah, I feel like I'm a little out of my depth, but um, the one thing you would want to make sure is, oh, so a windmill generates a lot of vibration. And so if it were made from clay, it would need to be fairly massive so that it could handle the vibration without coming apart. And I would put a lot of fiber in that clay, mm -hmm. right? And then the part that spins wants to be lightweight and have like a fairly large sail profile, right? So that it blows. Mm -hmm. There are examples though of windmills from your region that are, um, and a little bit, a little bit, I uh, see now I'm getting geography messed up. We don't Maybe take Sandor geography. In the island. Maybe in so in a, I saw them, I think they were Iranian. I'm not a hundred percent sure, mm -hmm. but um, it was either, yeah, and they're completely natural. They're from 500 years ago. Wow. And they were used to pump water. Um, and that would be the example I would look up because that's, you know, it's clearly, you know, uh, somebody solved this problem centuries ago. And <laughs> I'm outside my depth because it's not something I've designed or yeah, built. Fair enough. I wasn't sure if I should ask or not. No, I love it. It's a great question. Yeah, great one. Thanks. 
Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for joining us as well, Afridati. Thank you. All right. So quickly then, we got one from Joe. It's quite long. He's talking about lime and calcium carbonate fiber plaster for ceilings renders. And what's the coldest temperature you do lime work in? He's in mm. Bulgaria, so it probably gets a bit cold. Uh, lots of sunny winter days where it'll reach 15 degrees Celsius, that is, but minus mm -hmm. 5 to 10 as well in the evenings. Uh, yeah. Too risky to apply lime renders outdoors. And he's run out yes. of summer now. Yeah, so um, lime, I, I'm going to do this in Fahrenheit just because I know for sure what the numbers too, are and yeah. I don't want to yeah, approximate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go for that. Um, so lime cures by chemically um, bonding the calcium hydroxide, uh, chemically bonds with cal uh, carbon dioxide in the air to create calcium carbonate. So it's a chemical process and every chemical process is faster when it's warm and slower when it's cold. And the lime chemical process, the lime curing comes to a halt, it stops at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't know, roughly three or four or five it's Celsius. It's not much above, yeah, it's not much above zero degrees, you're right. right? It comes to a halt. So if at any point, and it takes a very long time for that carbonation, that curing process to occur. Right. So typically, and it takes longer if it's cooler. So if you're even asking the question, then you want 10 days minimum, where it is over 40 degrees Fahrenheit, always. The whole entire 10 days. Always. And there is no risk that it will drop below because the chemical process stops and it doesn't always start back up again. So don't risk it. If it freezes while it is damp, water again is bigger as ice than a liquid and so that those little tiny bits of water inside the plaster expand and break apart the molecules of um, calcium carbonate it breaks them apart so they are no longer bonded to each other they're broken bond and the whole wall looks crazed and when it fully cures it's just dusty it all falls off it's not worth the risk wait till spring yeah yeah okay Thanks it's a good that. question though a great question yeah good point yeah. as well because we are we, you know northern hemisphere heading into winter now or at least autumn but um all right it's quick uh, what's this uh i'll alarm render a wall tomorrow interesting all right so that's <laughs> somebody else that's milo good luck hopefully it's above zero degrees there, don't you? yeah uh i'll take a question any, okay, Sophie's asking, uh, any recommendations for a wet climate with potential water, ground, water underground? Um, not sure if that's regarding, where's is, is Sophie on? Yes, can, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you, yes. Okay. okay, there you go, Sophie, yeah, go for it. So you're talking I, about wet climate with potential water underground, elaborate? I mean, I may yeah. have a spring under, uh, like very close to the, to the house. Right. So um, I'm wondering what's the best solutions to avoid the humidity to come into the walls and this and the. Um... Ah, okay. So you're asking about how to prevent rising dampness from the ground to come yeah. up into the space. Yeah. Yeah. So um, can I ask you a follow up question? What kind of foundation oh, yeah. are you doing? And is your floor framed up off the ground or directly on the ground or are you still designing what it will look like well actually i don't know it's a renovation and it's a house made of stone and okay. i'm not sure there is foundation well if the building is standing there's a foundation okay <laughs> <laughs> it just might be really yeah. simple yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure I completely understand this situation. So, but um, generally speaking, um, with rising damp, you need to uh, address two different issues. It's again, the liquid versus vapor. So you need to address liquid water coming up. If you have liquid water coming out of the ground, like there shouldn't be a building there. It yeah, should be a spring house and you shouldn't, I, yeah. I was just about to say, I think that's maybe the, where the, the main question, yeah. where the question's coming from, uh, is that it's near water, it's near a body of water that she wants to build. Is that right, Sophie? 
It sounds like there is something there. Sophie? Can you repeat? I did not get it, sorry. I was, sorry, I was just saying it sounds as if you want to ask about building near a body of water. Uh, yeah, the thing is that the house is already there. It's oh, a renovation. It's really there. Ah, and what, so what foundation and that does it have already? Well, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, oh. most likely it's stone. And it's, has it been there, how long has it been there for? Quite a long time. Long time, okay. It's 100 years maybe. So, ah, so yeah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be, it's gotta be something like stone, right? So I'm not, so it sounds like you're trying to mitigate moisture in some yeah. way. In other words, there's a moisture issue and you're trying to solve that problem. Is that correct? And if yeah, so, what is the can. moisture issue? What are the moisture is issue? Uh, I have uh, some, some green stuff in the, inside the, the, the wall. Oh, Mold or oh. Something, right? Okay. Is, you have a very complicated situation is what I would say. Um, it sounds like whatever is between, between your living space and that wet ground needs to have better ventilation so that the humidity from that below is not rising into your space. Um, it sounds like you probably have condensation issues on your walls. Um, you could mitigate that by putting clay plasters everywhere. Um, but mold is very toxic. And if it is, if, so it sounds like you have green mold, which is usually mostly an allergen. If you have black mold, which tends to be inside the walls because it cannot see the light of day, it's like the vampire of molds. Um, if you have black mold, it is a neurotoxin. It affects yeah. your brain, it affects your memory, it affects your ability to um, have cognitive uh, deadly, patterns. Deadly stuff. So yeah, so it should be mitigated immediately. I, I would have a, an expert come and look at your particular issue and figure out exactly what is causing the problem. I feel ill-equipped to solve that big of a problem on a zoom call <laughs> yeah Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> that's the building's already built right so it's a bit and what kind of that. expert could sorry what kind of expert can can help me with this i mean here i don't know there but here we have people who um who work specifically on mold mitigation okay yeah and so the issue is that you have you have moisture building up and somebody needs to figure out where is it coming from. It could be all from below, in which case ventilating the space below and adding clay plasters throughout the upstairs would solve the problem. Um, if there's a leak in the roof, that's not going to solve the problem. You need to fix whatever that leak is. You know, there's so many places that water can be coming in. Yeah, that's a lot of variables. But yeah. I think the best thing, Sophie, is to actually find out if you can get maybe a student, even if you can, you know, if you kind of, I don't know what your budget's like, but uh, you could possibly approach a, a local uh, university, speak to them, see, see uh, the, the a microbiology or biology kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, fraternity, see if they would recommend maybe a PhD student or master student could come out to you as, as to have a look or to give you some advice even. Alternatively, you might want to go the commercial route and actually hire somebody who is a mold specialist in, in your in your area, in your city. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But get it checked out because yeah, as Lexi yeah. said, mold's not good, eh? But if it's condensation on the wall surfaces inside, then clay plaster everywhere would solve your problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we're gonna finish off yeah all right um unless there's one final did anybody find out where the 14 story or 10 story building in africa is because i i'm like i'm intrigued but i'll tell you what I, I i found some interesting stuff right there's there's a whole city that still stands and i think it's like ethiopia or um, um somalia or something like that right old john where's that it's a whole palace that's been Still standing and it's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years which i also found phenomenal when i was looking up some background uh, stuff to, you know, into, into the 
into our discussions tonight, which I think is just phenomenal. It blew my mind as to what's possible, right? It blew my mind as to what's possible. But yeah, um, anything you'd like to close with, uh, CD, on your side? Uh, um, just a reminder, not, you know, if you find yourself drawn to natural building and you hear those voices telling you you can't do it, listen to them and tell them, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And, uh, and that, you know, obviously they then can follow your, if they're in America, hopefully you'll have your dates for next year's workshops. Yeah. Up soon. Yeah. Or, so or we're, year. we're, we usually um, announce in November and we've delayed just because of COVID. So I just, I want to see how COVID is going to play out here. I think we're about to get pretty bad. So um, we're waiting for the calm after the storm before we announce our workshops, but it should be in January or February for sure. All right. But for the people that, you know, just like uh, Siki said as well earlier on, you know, uh, and, and previously to, to me in our chat, Try and find the local people that are in your area, guys. You know, it's phenomenal to have Zoom talks like this with, with somebody of Ziggy's uh, stature and, and, and character, which is awesome. But really, we need to make sure that uh, you're also looking at where your local uh, where your local skills and that are, you know, and um, mm -hmm. to essentially to, uh, to tap into those just as much as we would with local uh, ingredients and local materials and... Um, all the local conditions, really, at the end of the day. Um, I think there's one more question with bathrooms, bathrooms with concrete walls and entry condensation. Okay. Does it, would it make sense to put a clay coating on the wall or is that lime plaster again? So in the shower itself, you, you could use clay everywhere, but in the shower itself, I would do a thick lime plaster, but know that you have to do it um, like one centimeter at a time. Uh, and then let it cure and then do the next and then let it cure. Um, but if you did, you know, two to three centimeters of lime plaster in the shower, that gives you a nice um, waterproof finish. And lime is not as hygroscopic as clay, but it does have those same hygroscopic properties. Um, and then clay everywhere else would be absolutely phenomenal. Then you don't have a mildew issue. You don't have a mold issue. You don't have condensation on your walls every time you take a shower. Um, yes, yes, clay in the bathroom. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, last one I think we're going to do then, and we're going to call it a night, is a uh, family house. I think this is Aphrodite again, Cyprus. 75 years old. It's made with cob. Um, he was advised to preserve it because it needed to have some repairs to add concrete around. So he did. And, uh, now there's various issues, which I imagine there are. Um, oh. Discussion of humidity, water leaks, etc. Can you advise? Uh, and what oh. would you like to advise about that? Oh, that hurts my heart. That sounds, um, yeah, that sounds. Yeah. Good. So there was. For advice, there was. Yeah. Um, there was a period of time in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s where the old Southwest Adobe buildings, which is the same material as Cobb, but just made into bricks. Um, those Adobe buildings were, you know, modernized and they, instead of for centuries, they had been using lime wash and lime plasters mm -hmm. and they switched to cement plaster. Um, and within 20 years, they had failures and, the, and that's in a dry climate. And the reason why is that, um, Plaster materials should always, if they're not the same material all the way through, so if you do layers and it's not the same thing each time, then the first thing that goes on needs to be the hardest and the most, uh, I'm sorry, the hardest and the least vapor permeable. And on the outside that looks at the weather every day needs to be the softest and most permeable. In other words, you want any erosion to happen from the outside in and not the other way around. And cement is a hard non-permeable finish. So what happens is it, um, and it's brittle. So it creates cracks over time, moisture gets in through the cracks, it can't get back out and it starts to erode the clay, which is softer behind. And eventually what's gonna happen is that cement is just gonna pop off. 
right. and you will have eroded clay behind. So it should be finished. It, so, I mean, this is a horrible answer and I apologize, but it's the correct answer. The cement should come off or, or wait for it to fail, wait for it to come off because it will, and then use a lime plaster instead of uh, a cement plaster. It should have just not, it should never have been cement. And we've known, yeah, this is. All right. So I've, that I've, hurt my heart. I've to answer and I, I feel your pain, both of you, and hopefully you can uh, you know, come right with that if, if it is you. Um, uh, okay, uh, so it looks like you might, you, you might, there might be some interest in you touring, Siggy, so if your passport's ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, right now, we can't go anywhere, because nobody will help us. Yeah, it's terrible, <laughs> come on. Um, <laughs> you and me both, I mean, geez, I'd, yeah, I'd love to be somewhere a bit warmer at this stage of the, of yeah. the season here, but yeah. here we are. Um, yeah. Um, Love to again. I'm just going to say in closing, thanks for coming on board. Love to have you. Mm. It's been amazing. You, you're awesome. And thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. And thanks for everybody else for joining us, guys. Zanel, thanks for co-hosting. It's been great. Thanks for your commentary as well. And all the guys open and open and honest questions. Uh, it's been phenomenal. So uh, if you want to catch a replay of this, thanks Holger as well. Uh, if you want to uh, and Emil, if you want to uh, catch a replay of this, uh, it'll come through in the emails. Uh, so if you subscribe there, you're going to get uh, the replay through that. And then, uh, yeah, all the best. Hopefully we can see you again, Siggy, with another another round sometime soon. Absolutely. And uh, we'll talk a little bit, of, maybe a little bit more in depth about specific things like Adobe floors and, you know, walls and, and finishes and stuff like that. That would be awesome as well. That would be great, yeah. No, thank you so much. It was my absolute pr pleasure to be here. So thanks. Thanks again. Appreciate it, Jeff. Guys, take care. All the best for Christmas coming up and the festive season, etc. wherever you are. Uh, yeah, go in peace and go well. And let's build naturally. Let's do it for the, for the, for the, <laughs> yes. for the planet and for ourselves, yeah? Teach exactly. it your friends and your family. That's what I also say about the bees. You know, once you become an ambassador, you get stung, literally. Uh, yeah. Literally, you do get stung when you teach bees. The bug has got you, right? So let's do the same with natural building. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Take care. Thanks to you. All Ciao right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Now and bye. Bye bye.